Hello, neighbors from across the meadow. Welcome to the Botanical Biohacking Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Miles. Today, I'm going to approach an herb which I'm sure you're very familiar with, and it's oregano. Now, we think oregano, whatever, not a big deal, right? Well, if we look historically, it kind of is, especially in the Mediterranean cultures. And it's something that I think merits a second look. Oregano is known as Oreganum vulgare. It's native to the temperate western and southwestern regions of Eurasia and the Mediterranean. The ancient Egyptians used it for medicinal purposes as well as a disinfectant and as a preservative. Hippocrates, the father of Western medicine, who undoubtedly was learning from his comedic Mediterranean superpower teachers, echoed this lauding its value as an antiseptic. Now, I say that because a lot of times we get the idea that Greek culture kind of came out of nowhere, but really the superpower of the time was Egypt. So it'd be kind of like saying, all right, here's the United States. It's really well developed. And then here's a little island off of the United States. It's just kind of getting started. People are wearing furs, chucking spears, but they created everything. Well, not so much. So a lot of times with a Eurocentric view, we kind of lose out on the Afro-European spread of information. So yes, Hippocrates, good very cool, and the information on oregano as an antiseptic definitely predated him. The Romans would use sachets of oregano, combining it with rosemary and lavender to scent their linens and baths, and that sounds kind of delicious. The natural fibers in their cloths were susceptible to getting bugs, so they used these packets of dried oregano to repel moths and other insects. The absolute earliest record of oregano dates to around 1200 to 1600 BC. There were tablets with inscriptions and images of the plant dating to this area and time in the Bronze Age around what today we would call Syria. The word oregano comes from the Greek oros, meaning mountain, and ganos, meaning joyful or brilliant. It was said to have been created by the goddess Aphrodite, goddess of love and fertility. She planted it around her home in Mount Olympus. Afterwards, well, maybe not afterwards, but related to this mythology, Greeks would plant oregano around their homes with the idea that it would ward off evil spirits and also was used for culinary and medicinal purposes. It grows very easily. It's a good thing to have around the house. Aristotle recommended it for snake bites. I wouldn't bet your life on that, but, you know, who knows what kind of snakes he was dealing with. Dioscorides was a Greek Roman who wrote the first Materia Medica in the West. He described it as the best remedy for appetite loss. And This is really getting to where we tend to see the pharmacology and where we see a lot of the effects. It has very strong effects on gut microbiota. In Persian medicine, it was used for the treatment of respiratory, gastrointestinal, and neurologic disorders. And recently in Iran, they tested this on mice and found that it had anxiolytic effects on mice. So it helped those Persian mice to relax a bit. French physician Henri Leclerc in 1922 wrote about using it for patients with atonic or dilated stomachs in his book on phytotherapy. I believe he coined the term. So oregano can be used as a spice, which we know and love. It also can be used as a tea. A lot of people drink it as a tea and use it for stomach problems. Interestingly, it can also be mulled into wine, for a range of claims from respiratory problems, obesity, and gastrointestinal problems. Mostly, it seems to influence the GI system 
and the respiratory system. And by way of the gut respiratory axis, there these are really two of the main powerhouses for gut microbiota, and oregano seems to keep these in check, possibly through its high concentrations of phenols such as thymol and carvacol and rosmaric acid, which presumably is similar to rosemary. Oregano is also nifty in that it can inhibit candida. Now, candida can get where it really shouldn't be. A little bit is fine. It's part of our natural uh, natural yeast that should be in the body, but if you get too much, it can influence, of course, vaginal health and fertility, which may be why it was linked with Aphrodite. It appears to have antiseptic, antimicrobial, antifungal, and antiviral activities. So, points to the Egyptians. It seems that they were able to figure that out without the help of aliens. Oregano is increasingly being used with agriculture because if you are using antibiotic-free fish, koi, or chickens, you can get away with that statement so long as you're giving them oregano, which seems to enhance nonspecific immunity and has effects on the structure of gut microbiota and, of course, has its antibiotic, antifungal, and antiviral effects. The flowers, or the top parts, have been traditionally used for bronchitis. So if you want to make a wine of this, you take about 50 grams of the flowering tops, 50 grams per liter of sweet wine, steep for about 10 days, and then drink three cups a day to improve digestion and conversational skills. This has a mild antibacterial and anti-inflammatory effect, how that compares with the wine itself, I don't know. Maybe it's just for fun. Yeah, give it a try. Let me know what you find. Oregano, of course, is used extensively in Italian food. The types of oregano are slightly different. So if it's grown in a southern or warmer climate, it tends to have more of a pungent quality to it. A good quality oregano is said to be strong enough to numb the tongue. Cultivars have been adapted to colder climates. That's generally what I tend to get a hold of at the grocery store, but the flavor is very mild. So the factors of climate and season and soil composition seem to affect the aromatic oils even to a greater extent than the minor variations in plant species. Mexican oregano is thought to be more spicy Given that it thrives in southern climates, I'm inclined to believe that the Mexican variety may be more in line with the claims made by Mediterranean peoples and people in the Middle East. I don't have any proof of this. It's just a feeling I have based on taste, and it seems to be more pungent. Another reason for my thoughts on this is because while oregano is known in China, it is only used medicinally in some of the hottest areas, such as Guizhou and Yunnan. There, it's used similarly to patchouli or huoxiang to release the exterior, aromatically transform dampness, and transform pain associated with microbial dysbiosis. One of my favorite ways to enjoy oregano is with the spice mix called zatar. Originally, this refers to a specific spice which was a type of oregano from Syria, Oreganum Syriacum, which, remember, that's the oldest description we have is from what's today Syria. So this type may be, you know, that makes sense. That's the neck of the woods where it was first presumably discovered, at least first written about. Over time, Zatar had come to refer to a spice mix and it varies slightly based on regions in the Middle East, as well as even from one household to the next. They may have a secret mixture. Generally, we're looking at dried thyme, oregano, marjoram, and a combination thereof, mixed with toasted sesame seeds and salt. Other spices, such as sumac, might be added as well. Zatar 
is traditionally combined with olives. People will dip flatbread in olive oil and then za'atar as a breakfast food, and it may be one of the best things that has ever happened to chicken. I like to take an Instant Pot, throw chicken in it, add olive oil, and then just dump loads of za'atar on top of it. Add uh, the, you know, put it on the saute or meat setting. 20 minutes later, you get something absolutely delicious. It is also something that I personally add to a type of spaghetti from Naples. So the spaghetti and marinara and uh, meatballs, a lot of that is uh, kind of Sicilian American, the way that we think of it in the United States. In Italy, there are varieties of ways that you might eat spaghetti. One of those from Naples is simply garlic and olive oil with herbs added. And this is called aglio e olio, which I think that sounds cool. So the way this is done is you take some olive oil and you add garlic into it, let it saute a little bit. Meanwhile, you get some spaghetti noodles cooking. I like to get the water boiling, add some salt, put the spaghetti in so it's kind of slanted up at an angle, wait a minute or so until one end starts to get soft, use tongs to flip it so that both ends get soft, and then when they're both kind of equally soft, I let it settle into its bath like it's a nice hot tub. I'll add a little bit of olive oil to make sure that the noodles don't get sticky, and then cook it from anywhere to uh, from five to seven minutes, depending on how chewy you want it. I believe the way they do it in Naples is a little bit, little bit chewy. So some people will add just a little bit of mozzarella to it. I personally don't. Uh, the other difference that I apply to this, which may be a sacrilege, but I don't care, is I add some Sichuan peppers into the oil mix, which I find just gives it a little bit more of a zip. And toward the end, I will add oregano or some other spices, maybe an Italian herb mix to it, just to add a little more plant life to it. Then you add the oil on top of the noodles and you're good to go. This is very fast. It takes you know, maybe 10 minutes to prepare all together. It tastes delicious and it's fairly healthy and also not expensive. This is one of History on Fire podcast Daniele Bolelli's favorite pasta meals. So he recommended, I asked him which noodles would he suggest. He likes to get the noodles which are imported directly from Italy. These may have lower gluten contents than some of the whole wheat that is in the United States. The brands he recommended were uh, Barilla and was it De Checho? I think that's De Checho. Um, so these are thin noodles, and they're imported directly from Italy. And I find that yeah, this is a very cheap meal, honestly, to make it. It costs very, very little, like under a dollar per serving. But getting good quality noodles really makes the difference, makes a very huge difference, and I think it's worth going toward. So there you have it. Oregano, it's, uh, it's good. So... Yes, I like to get dried oregano. I also get the little sprigs from the grocery store and I pop it into a glass. I have a bunch just flowering up out of a wine glass right now. It grows pretty quickly, just left on its own like that. The flavor isn't as pungent as when I get the Mexican oregano. In the future, I think I'm just going to get more of the Mexican oregano because that which kind of grows in the kitchen, it's not hot enough to really develop those aromatic oils out of it. And when going for herbs, it's best to go for quality if you can. So that's my suggestion. Give that a whirl if you like. And yeah, if you're curious, try the oregano with a sweet wine and see how it does. Um, the culture of infusing medicinal herbs with food is something that's very important for humanity. And I hope that yeah, I hope you try some of this and let me know what you find. Um, if I have committed a grievous sin against all Italians by altering the recipe, 
Again, please let me know at andrew at botanicalbiohacking.com. Thank you so much for listening to the Botanical Biohacking Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Miles.